with the contents of my presentation looks like this. So first tribute to two late scientists, then some basic facts, and then uh, this kind of a structure uh, for ultraviolet li uh, radiation, light and infrared radiation each. So first experiments, further experiments, mechanistic explanations, our contribution from my team and current guidelines. So first tribute to goes to this scientist who said that we can scarcely avoid the conclusion that light consists in the transverse undulations of the same medium, which is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. And he was uh, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, who died uh, in Cambridge, uh, but was buried in Parton in Scotland. And he's tributed because of, uh, for the theory of electromagnetic radiation that covers ele electricity, magnetism, and uh, light. And of the solar radiation, daylight, the wavelengths of about 290 to 2,500 nanometers, that's the portion that reaches Earth's surface. And of that, there's 4% ultraviolet radiation, mostly of UVA, 43% uh, uh, visible light, and 53% of infrared radiation. And of these wavelengths, artificially we use uh, most for treatment. So wavelengths of 290 uh, to 1000 100 nanometers are used for uh, treatment uh, of various range of diseases nowadays. If we look at these wavelengths uh, deeper, uh, we see that uh, how they can penetrate into the skin. So ultraviolet radiation usually that is uh, used for treatment of skin diseases uh, goes down to depth of 0.1 millimeter or so. But the visible light and of course infrared radiation goes deeper into the skin, even below, under the skin. So down into fat layer, subcutaneous fat layer. The second tribute goes to this scientist who <clears throat> wrote that I was of course interested to know what benefit the sun really gave. I considered from the physiological point of view, but got no answer. What this useful effect really was, I couldn't find. I have been working for this goal ever since, but have not been able to find exactly what I have been seeking, though we have gone somewhat forward. And he was uh, Niels Finsen, who was awarded a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1903 uh, in recognition of his contribution to the treatment of diseases, especially lupus vulgaris, uh, skin tuberculosis, with concentrated light radiation, whereby he has opened a new avenue for medical science. And the, his aborted experiments were like this. So for the treatment of skin tuberculosis, uh, sunlight is concentrated by means of glass lenses of appropriate composition into a beam from which the heat rays have been as far as possible eliminated. You see the picture here on the left side. Uh, this beam is projected on a small area of affected skin, which has been drained of blood by pressure. Uh, this uh, picture here shows the pressure I think that was essential for the effect of, of this treatment. The beam of light is applied continuously for two hours with sunlight, and later it was one hour with the carbon arc lamp he invented. And, and from uh, 1895 to 1903, a total of 1,100 patients were treated by his method. And how did this method work? 
Danish <coughs> scientists have studied this case further. Uh, first, of course, in 1896, Finsen had himself stated that what he called chemical light, so chemical wavelengths in a way, and identified those as blue, violet, and ultraviolet uh, were responsible for killing bacteria, tuberculosis bacteria. So the Danish scientist currently uh, studied his uh, equipment, measured uh, radiation that could be transmitted through his lens systems and absor absorption of, of the stain solution filters he used in the, in the carbon arc lamps. And all these te tested lenses of glass and filters absorb wavelengths of below 340 nanometers. And this methylene blue solution, which, was, which he used to absorb heat, they blocked out the wavelengths of also below 340, as well as 550 to 700 nanometers. So uh, then they, these Danish scientists analyzed um, that there has to be, there had to be some intracellular um, porphyrins present in, in, with, together with the bacteria. So radiation of these porphyrins, which are photosensitizers with rays of sunlight, may have led the production of singlet oxygen and killed the bacteria as they did in, in these Danish experiments currently in vitro uh, in six minutes. So they concluded that this is the most plausible explanation why Finsen's method worked. Uh, so in fact, wavelengths of ultraviolet A1 to green light contributed to the efficacy of, of Finsen's method. So in principle, Finsen was uh, right, but he, I, I think, and he thought that it might be mostly because of ultraviolet radiation, especially ultraviolet B radiation that would be effective. So let's go to the, now this spectrum through and start with ultraviolet radiation. First experiments, <clears throat> um, well, in the 19th century, and there was this uh, a move to a location with a pleasant climate that was a common practice for wealthy Europeans, even without any medical condition or condition that was in need of medical attention. So this sanatorium or health spa movement proper provided isolation, complete bed rest to only mild physical activity daily, meals, as well as clean and fresh air with time in the sun and can be called as climatotherapy. Uh, of interest, there's a medical documentation on climatotherapy uh, where a winter depressed patient was sent from Finland's Lapland to Germany after the two polar winters he suffered plus treated with ultraviolet rays uh, after the second polar winter and get, uh, well, there was no benefit of that, uh, but there was a, re a spontaneous remission by October 1944. You can read this from this 1946 uh, article uh, more in detail. And another attempt to treat winter depression with ultraviolet radiation was made later in Harvard Medical School at the turn of the 1970s, 1980s. And again, the response was similar, that there was no benefit. So maybe ultraviolet radiation is not a treatment for winter depression. Well, uh, to continue with the first experiments, although sanatoria were designed to be sunlit, facilities for sun bathing were not normally provided. So the first open air sanatorium for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis was run in Silesia region uh, in, uh, starting in 1854 and ending in 1904. Since this establishment, there were many more till the 1950s. And uh, the systematic use of sunlight as medical therapy, we can call it heliotherapy, 
was started in Lees in Switzerland in 1903. And uh, the protocol was as follows. So after one to two weeks of open air acclimatization, heliotherapy began on the solaria and balconies, where exposure to the sun at temperatures of more than 18 degrees centigrade, so-called hot air bath, should be avoided. Uh, and it was said that a very current mistake consists in thinking that the sun bath is all the more efficacious if prolonged or taken when the sun is at its hottest. And the protocol or regime was like this. So heliotherapy began in the summer months at 5 uh, to 9 a.m. The earlier, the lower the altitude was. And it was seized before the heat of the midday sun when the blinds were drawn. And then it goes from the first day uh, till the 15th day, uh, gradually uh, increasing the exposure to the sunlight. It was to treat tuberculosis of the joints, not pulmonary tuberculosis, because there was the danger of hemoptosis, bleeding and reactivation of disease and a spread of infection. And the advice was the sun should be dispensed, so to speak, drop by drop when nearing the region of the thorax. And with this kind of a regime from uh, 1903 to 1913, uh, Auguste Rollier uh, uh, treated um, patients uh, with the success rate of 75% in restoring joints to normality. But these experiments came to an end by two reasons. So there was a sunlight used for treatment of rickets, rachitis in children or osteomalacia in adults from 1890s to the 1930s. But after the invention of how to produce vitamin D, which is in fact pro-hormone, uh, uh, these first experiments were over. So vitamin D could be added to food by ultraviolet irradiation, fortification or supplementation. And sunlight was also used from the 1900 to the 1950s for granulating and infective wounds open to tuberculosis cavities, tuberculosis of the bones and joints, and close tuberculosis foci of the glands. But these experiments came to their end because of the invention of antibiotics plus vaccination against tuberculosis. So exposure to sunlight and the use of heliotherapy were responses to two big health issues at one time. Our contribution regarding ultraviolet radiation is that we have studied whether it can produce mood enhancing effects and whether it affects uh, the circadian clock in the skin as well as in the subcutaneous fat. We have used narrowband ultraviolet B uh, and ultraviolet A1 as well as placebo for this ultraviolet A1 exposure. Current guidelines for ultraviolet radiation, uh, it's called phototherapy for some reason. Uh, you can use broadband ultraviolet B radiation, narrowband ultraviolet B radiation, and ultraviolet A1 radiation. For some reason, this ultraviolet A2 radiation, these wavelengths are not used in for treatment. Indications nowadays cover psoriasis vulgaris and many other skin diseases. Then light. First and non avoided experiments by Niels Finsen again for treatment of smallpox. The chemical rays, he said, ultra, meaning ultraviolet rays, are filtered off by means of red glass and red curtains, etc., 
thus preventing the irritative effect on the affected skin. And the reason was that now treatment could be given, administered, without having to keep the patient in total darkness, but in the red light, like in the dark room, for days. But this was <clears throat> um, confronted by, by scientists, and Finsen wrote, it has been difficult, of course, to get the method generally accepted or even tried. It was too marvelous and it gave rise to skepticism. I can hardly believe that skepticism in regard to this method is so great that the idea of a careful scientific investigation would be flatly refused at a moment when the therapeutic importance of light as a means of treating lupus and other diseases of the skin must be said to be generally admitted everywhere. He wrote this in 1903. Half a year later, he was awarded Nobel Prize. Experiments then revisited, as I call them, uh, uh, along these ideas of earlier experiments. So there's dark therapy, then for darkness from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. for rapidly cycling bipolar disorder, first um, uh, given, reported by Thomas A. Ware. Uh, then there was this uh, invention of what, to, what if using blue lighting blocking lenses from 8 p.m. to bedtime for bipolar disorder, uh, and etc. But the real cutting edge experiments for using light uh, in treatment was that it was found to be effective for depressive episodes. So exposure to white about full spectrum light, 2000 lux for a depressive episode of bipolar disorder, first reported by Alfred Louis. Then there was uh, this report by Daniel Kripke, uh, 1000 to 2000 lux for depressive episodes. Um, and then followed by 2500 lux for seasonal affective disorder, reported first uh, author was Norman Rosenthal. And since 1985, many others tried these uh, treatment uh, guidelines in Switzerland, the Netherlands, UK, Norway, Sweden, Finland, etc. And then uh, exposure to dawn simulation up to 1000 lux for seasonal affective disorder was described in report by Michael Terman and his co-workers. All these <clears throat> used light treatment, so-called, let's say, bright light treatment or dawn simulation treatment. Bright light treatment uh, regards refers to 2,500 lux. It could be very, about similar that you uh, read out the measure here uh, from the lux meter put here on the grass at 5 to 10 a.m. That's the difference. So the timing of the light exposure is critical here, I think. In the retina, <clears throat> there are five kinds of photoreceptors. There are three kinds of cones. Then there are rods. And then there are these intrinsically photoreceptor retinal ganglion cells as well. And they produce integrated signals leaving the retina to the brain. And timing of light therapy, light treatment with visible light usually is timed for in, in treatment of winter depression from 9 to 10 a.m. So it's the time when you can achieve phase advances of the circadian rhythms most clearly. But nowadays, usually we are exposed to artificial light throughout the day from the morning to the evening and there's no variation in intensity of light exposure. Uh, it may lead to circadian misalignment, maybe even circadian disruption and if this condition continues for weeks, for years, it can end in 
uh, cardiovascular diseases, low-grade inflammation, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity, some mental health disorders like depressive disorders, and maybe some skin diseases as well. So electrical lighting and the constructed environment as compared with natural exposure to sunlight uh, leads to a situation when there, where, where there is reduced exposure to the sunlight, of course, but also increased light exposure after sunset, marked here with yellow, and this results in slowing down the circadian clock and uh, face delays of the circadian rhythms and uh, maybe underlying this kind of a circadian misalignment or even circadian disruption. Our contribution with light treatment, we have studied since the early 1990s, circadian rhythms in seasonal activity disorder, sleep structure in those patients as well. Also, can we use exposure to morning bright light in the blind and to have some uh, mood enhancing effects then for use uh, for preventive use of uh, light treatment for winter type of seasonal affective disorder. Then we have studied physical exercise alone or combined with bright light uh, on mood. And then also light treatment in healthy people and uh, made a community-based trial with dawn simulators as well. Current guidelines regarding light treatment with uh, visible radiation, their indications are seasonal affective disorder, also the milder form called subsyndromal seasonal affective disorder, and then these circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders. And lastly, the infrared radiation of the spectrum first experiments uh, starts from 1960s, uh, 1966 to 1985, more than 1,000 patients were treated with low energy laser radiation by Mester's method here on the left hand side, a uh, ruby or helium neon laser was used for this laser beam therapy. Uh, then 2001, near infrared light therapy with uh, NASA LED for wound healing and since then experiments for other conditions. So LEDs can be used for this kind of a treatment as well, like here on the top. And then there was a new invention using whole body hypothermia that was induced by water, in, water filtered infrared A radiation and used for treatment of major depressive disorder. Uh, 2013 was the first publication of this indication. It's experimental treatment at the moment. And the idea of infrared radiation has been that it stimulates the cytochrome C oxidase in the mitochondria. So it uh, necessitates the local administration of infrared radiation above the uh, region you want to treat. Uh, of interest, there's a links between uh, a metabolic network in our body with, uh, to circadian network in our body. So they, they have a crosstalk with each other. And the absorption peaks of cytochrome C oxidase are indicated here. Uh, there are three peaks, um, slices of the spectrum. One of those is in the infrared radiation wavelengths. Our contribution to the infrared radiation studies has been that we have used this water filtered infrared A radiation administered on the buttocks and lower back from, from part body radiators. So we test the hypothesis whether the effect is mediated uh, by the influence on the circadian clock in the skin or whether it could be mediated by 
shutting down the uh, brown adipose tissue. It might be that in the depressed persons, uh, brown fat is overactive. And by administering infrared uh, radiation, you can shut down this overactive brown fat activity. We have studied uh, with uh, this, uh, our, our um, uh, interventions by uh, taking punch biopsies down to the six millimeters. So we have skin and subcutaneous fat samples, and we have made molecular genetics analysis, omics analysis, which genes are upregulated, which genes are downregulated before, after. So what the effect influence of, of these interventions with ultraviolet B as well as with infrared uh, radiation are uh, on the circadian clock in the skin. Current guidelines for infrared radiation, it's nowadays called also photobiomodulation with low level laser or LED light therapy. It covers these wavelengths, so there's also visible light, orange light, red light usually, and then of course infrared A radiation. And indications seems to be local indications so far, pain in knee, osteoarthritis and shoulder tendinopathies, muscle injury, and foot ulcer, especially in type one or type two diabetes. And the acknowledgement goes to my co-workers at my institute, uh, at University of Helsinki, at Aalto University, at Tampere University, at Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority of Finland, at University of Eastern Finland, at Karolinska Institute, and at Medical University of Vienna. Thanks for attention. Thank you, Timo. That was a very, very insightful presentation. I can also confirm that I hardly get 2,500 lux, <laughs> even if I'm outside in the winters when it's cloudy in Berlin. So um, we look forward to more questions. Uh, so if you are joining in or you already saw Timo's presentation, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A Zoom box, and I will take this up in the panel discussion later. <laughs>